I'm going to talk a bit more about how to do procedural generation for an infinite world. Uh, back in May, I wrote a blog post called Rolling Grids for Infinite Worlds that talked about how you can uh, have uh, an infinite uh, world with procedural generation where you basically have a 2D array that you can treat as infinite by having a, a scrolling or rolling window into your world that scrolls together with weather characters. And I'm going to go a bit into some of the considerations here that uh, you'll have to consider when uh, doing procedural generation that basically doesn't have any boundaries. So um, what we're looking at here is uh, some kind of uh, spherical uh, worlds. Uh, they're a bit abstract at this stage, but they're meant to uh, represent a kind of worlds that are connected by uh, some pathways uh, that you can uh, use to travel between them. Um, and this world is uh, extends infinitely in all directions. So I could uh, I can scroll this world here, and it basically goes on forever in any direction. Um, and there's many things like this uh, where you can do all kinds of interesting things with procedural generation. Uh, which are not that tricky by themselves. Uh, for something like this, if it uh, had bounds, you could throw in a bunch of random points and give them some uh, radiuses and make sure they don't overlap, adjust as necessary, and then find some good way to connect them. And once you've handled all that for all the points, then you're done. But the problem is when it's infinite, then you never have the whole picture. So uh, you never have all the neighbors available because there'll always be some extra neighbors outside of the currently loaded bounds. So let's try to look at how this is uh, implemented. If we zoom out sufficiently, we can see that um, Things are loaded in different levels of detail. Uh, in uh, the the, the fill out we get from the position of the camera or player or whatever you use to to define as the center of the currently loaded part of the world. Uh, the the fill out you go from there, the less information we have. So um, let's try to turn on. Uh, some the grid that we're using. Um, so this is the grid that this uh, procedural generation operates in. And it actually eats... The way it works is that uh, the generation works in several layers. So uh, each layer can have more information, but it uh, requires that all the neighboring, the, uh, the eight neighbors, uh, are loaded up to the previous layer. So uh, let's take it from the beginning. In this case, the outermost uh, cells in the grid, the left, right, and top, and, and bottom, uh, they are loaded uh, to the level of zero. And that means, uh, in this case, that in each of these cells I uh, create a list of three random points within the cell. So that's all we have in layer zero in this, these outermost cells. Now in the next layer, um, the problem is with these random points, uh, since they're random they can end up being very close to each other and for this thing we want things to be not very evenly but at at least a little evenly distributed and it doesn't work well if some points are way too close to each other in that case. So we want to adjust the points but we cannot do that as long as we don't know the neighboring points in the other cells. If we only looked uh, and adjusted the points compared to other points in the same cell then they might just end up being very close to points in the neighboring cells. Um, 
So before we can make the adjustments, we have to know about the points in all the neighboring cells as well. So we have a layer one that's, that takes care of adjusting the points, but layer one requires uh, for a cell to be at layer one, it first requires that all the neighboring cells are loaded to layer zero. Uh, and once that is, that is the case, uh, we can adjust these points. Um, and you can see the old positions are marked in gray and the new adjusted ones are marked in white. The next layer, layer one, uh, we can begin to calculate uh, radiuses for the worlds. Uh, the radiuses requires that we know uh, the positions of these worlds as well as the neighboring worlds, but it has to be the final, the adjusted positions, not the initial ones. So we need to have all the neighboring cells loaded to layer one before we can calculate the radiuses in layer two. Uh, and then we can do that. And there's some randomness here as well. Uh, they get different sizes and uh, and depending on the radiuses of of each other, they can uh, they can have different sizes. Uh, now um, the next layer requires that we already know the radiuses of all the worlds, uh, and then we can begin to calculate connections between them. Um, what I do in this case is I first uh, do a, a Delaunay uh, triangulation uh, of the points and that's the points in this cell and all the neighboring cells uh, in order to figure out which of the points will look natural to connect but only use a subset of those um, I don't want uh, all the connections to form triangles. I want things to be a bit less connected. Uh, so you might sometimes have to take uh, a bit of a detour in order to get from, from one world to another. Uh, so I use a subset. I basically make sure all the worlds within the cell are connected to each other, uh, but not not that every planet is connected to every other one, but just that you can get from any one to the others through maybe a third one. Um, and then I also make sure that there's, uh, for each of the neighboring cells, there's at least one planet in, or one world in that cell that's connected to uh, the current cell, some planet in the current cell, so that there's some way to get to the neighboring cells, but only one pass that goes uh, between the cells. Um, and I, I do that by basically choosing uh, the shortest path that can connect the planet in, in the neighboring cell and this cell. Um, and that's it, then we basically, the more, uh, layers we have loaded, the, the more information we have about about the surroundings. Uh, and eventually I calculate some information within the planets themselves, but that's actually a bit unrelated to to what we're discussing here. Uh, and that's something that would be used for when going even more in details and zooming in on, on one planet and, and uh, it's used to whatever is actually going on with that planet itself. But that's not needed in, in this context, so I'll skip going into detail for, for that. Um, but, but that's it. Um, um, an approach with layers that depends on lower layers basically means that you can have infinite uh, procedural generation of uh, quite high complexity, even though you, you don't have any bounds. It just means that the more dependencies you have uh, between some local data and some data that's located around it, the more of this kinds of dependencies you have, the more layers you have to have, and the further out the the loaded area will have to extend. But but the furthest paths can be loaded only at a very low abstraction level. So. 
that's uh, that's the basics here. So these layers are kind of simple in that they all use the same grid size and know about each, each other. It's a fairly simple pattern here where each cell just depends on the neighboring uh, eight other cells. Um, but uh, for the game I'm developing, that's one of the uh, approaches I'm using. I'm also using a different approach with completely decoupled layers that can have different grid resolutions and where each layer is basically unaware of the internal implementation details of the other layers and they just ask each other for information from some given point in another layer and it doesn't care about what cells are loaded. It can basically treat other layers as just infinite. Um, but that's something for another talk. Um, before we stop for here, let's just look at the loading while it is zoomed out. So basically, as you move, new layers or new cells layer uh, are loaded in uh, both everything from layer zero at the outmost to and the and the things that are already loaded at layer zero get get upgraded to layer one and so on. So the center cells that are at the topmost layer, you get a shifting window of those and as they move out of the window again they get unloaded to lower layers progressively until they're completely unloaded. And this can just go on and on. That's it.